If you're about to kick off a brand identity project or maybe you're just looking for some inspiration to revamp your process and get an inside look at what another designer does, today I'm going to take you behind the scenes into a recent client project and show you a little bit of the delightfully organized chaos that is my process. Let's dive in. In the middle of 2021, the Ecru founders came to me with a vision to create a custom e-commerce website for their new business. They sell a variety of hand-woven towels and sort of homeware bits and bobs. And they were really keen to put up a custom website so that they could get these products to market quickly. We jumped on a discovery call and I asked them a bunch of questions about the business and their vision and where they wanted to go. I also asked them some questions about the types of customers they were hoping to attract and also wanted to know from them how they were planning to show up and whether they had anything I could use to establish the visual direction for the website. But it quickly sort of came about that they didn't actually have any of these resources available to them and really weren't very clear on who they wanted to attract and how they were going to do it. They were sort of just sure that you put up a website and you carry on. And now that belief wasn't misplaced. They had done their research and knew that they needed to put some time and attention into a custom website. But I said to them, I think you might have missed a step. And so in the discovery process, I asked them these questions. And what felt natural to me was to recommend to them a brand identity process first which would then allow them to have the foundation that they needed in order to, when they got to the website phase, to do that really well as well. I also said to them, because I knew in our conversation that they'd actually validated the product and that it was going to sell, there was a demand for it, but it was just how we differentiate them. How do we make them stand out in an otherwise fairly cluttered industry? So I recommended to them we have a look at a strategy process and then we look at obviously establishing a visual identity. So today's video is all about me taking you behind the scenes on the design side of things. I'll touch briefly on what we did for the strategy and discovery, but I'm pretty much just going to show you behind the scenes on how I ended up at the final identity and how I got there. So let's dive straight in. The first phase of my creative process is always strategic discovery. Now, this can be called a million different things, brand strategy, brand discovery, brand core discovery, whatever you want to call it. It's essentially the process where I guide my client through a series of exercises in a workshop format where I really want to sit with them and uncover the brand. So this kind of resulted in a couple of interesting things. The first thing was we put down some words that describe the brand, some keywords that really were going to act as our guide going forward. We did a bunch of other things as well, including understanding the customer. So we actually created two customer profiles that were slightly different. We had Alex, who was our consciously curated homemaker, and we had Jane, who was our professional perfectionist, because we knew that their market was going to be predominantly females between the ages of maybe their late 20s to late 40s and 50s and upwards, but it was really going to sit in that space. And it was going to be a blend of people who really valued, you know, the finer things in life, who really wanted their home to be sort of perfect and well tailored and neat and somebody who is going to really appreciate quality. And then our other customer, lovely Alex over here, was a little bit more relaxed and casual and really just focused on choosing things for her home that had been consciously um, designed or made and really was more concerned about the livability of the things that she buys. So with that in mind, um, and once they had approved that whole direction, we also laid down some things like a couple of personality traits for the business, like how do we want this brand to show up? We laid down a purpose statement and obviously created a bit of a guide on the brand's voice. So how do we want it to sound? All of these things really help me understand how to translate 
the concept of the brand and what's on the inside to what's on the outside. So we then jumped in to Pinterest and now I really enjoy Pinterest because it's a really easy way for me to grab ideas when I'm going into that visual inspiration phase. It's so easy to use. It's not fussy. I don't want to be fiddling with trying to add captions and saving images and doing all these fiddly bits. I like Pinterest because I can pretty much just save everything I need really quickly in one place. And I can have it on my phone as well, which really helps because inspiration can strike at any moment and it usually happens in the most random places. So having Pinterest always kind of available to me, let me kind of allow my creativity to flow and I could just gather ideas on the go as well as more concentrated sessions of sitting down. Now, Pinterest in this case was especially useful because they had actually sent me a Pinterest board that they'd curated themselves and that was really useful to me to be able to go and have a look at what was in their heads. I don't ever ask clients to actually do this, but if you're starting out, it can actually be a nice way to try and see what's in their minds. Just make sure that you give them a bit of guidance about what to actually save to those mood boards so that they're not putting a bunch of stuff on there that is appealing to them but isn't really useful to you. So um, basically I jumped into Pinterest and started gathering a whole bunch of ideas. Now the thing that I was really led by the most was knowing that these were organic homeware goods. So they had been hand woven by proper materials. None of it was synthetic. All of it was really beautiful and natural. And so I really wanted this style to be super f kind of friendly and organic. And I was really looking for particularly a logo style that was going to offer me sort of these rough edges and really wanted something that was perfectly imperfect if I can put it that way. So I started gathering all these ideas and another reason why I really like Pinterest is it has a Chrome extension which allows you to save images from all over the internet so you don't just have to use Pinterest you can use Dribbble and Behance as well to look for inspiration and actually just save it all in one place. So once I'd gone through and gathered all the inspiration that I thought I could possibly need I mean I'm seeing a lot of these like sort of organic shapes and I knew I wanted something that was a little bit more abstract but I wasn't 100% sure how how organic to take it. So I knew that they had mentioned the fact that they wanted something quite creative, but they had also mentioned the desire for the brand to be perceived as professional and premium with the word refined coming in there every now and then. So I knew that we were going to have to walk this line quite carefully. So basically gathering as much inspiration as I possibly could and realized I was probably going to have to present them to directions. But now in my creative process, I prefer doing the multiple directions in the early stages with mood boards rather than doing multiple logo concepts. Now, this is a bit of a controversial topic and let us know in the comments below if you want a video on whether to present one or multiple logo concepts to your clients. So personally, in my process, I like to do multiple mood boards and less logos. So let's jump in to what ended up happening with the stylescapes. Now, I tend to present stylescapes to my client. I usually gravitate toward the stylescapes. Sometimes I'll create a mood board and the difference is really the depth to which you go. Sometimes I prefer the clarity of a mood board because it allows you to really curate your images very carefully and present the bare minimum, which is a good way to test whether you've really grasped a concept or not. But I also really like the freedom of stylescapes to really customize the look that you're going to pitch to your client and really work it in. Now, the level of customization that you go with a stylescape 
sort of depends on your creative process. So jumping into my stylescapes over here, you can see that this first one is a bit more of the refined look. So I knew that we needed a direction like this. I needed to show them what it looked like so that we could decide whether or not this was the right move. So this one's got a bit more of a muted color palette, something that feels a little bit more refined and elegant. Um, that soft green is a nice nod to the organic and natural without being too obvious. Really wanted to balance this with a bit of sort of hand-drawn illustration, maybe some bolder patterns, but was really focusing on the sans serif fonts here for that sort of modern take and the more refined look. Um, and focusing on sort of a muted look, this always sort of gives you a more refined look when you simplify the color palette. So the fewer colors you have, sometimes the more elegant a brand can look, depending on the palette, of course. So this was the focus here and then we had our second direction which I pitched to them which was me going a little bit more down the creative side of things. So for this one I was looking at you know more interesting display typography, maybe cleaner lines, softer look and then warmer tones. So really bringing in the rusty brown and the warmer creams and a little bit more of a rustic feel with typography but still keeping it elegant and refined with the serifs, which give that give any brand a little bit more gravitas and professionalism. So these are the two directions that I pitched to them and they absolutely loved the directions, but upon reflection realized we might have sort of missed the mark. And as hard as it is to believe, this is my favorite part of the process is getting this feedback. And I never view negative feedback as negative feedback. To me, it's always about getting clarity. So we discussed it and realized that actually they weren't that attracted to the idea of being refined and professional. And they would rather focus on the story they wanted their products to tell. So we did a long chat and we worked out basically how we were going to phrase this. And we spoke about the fact that they wanted their products to basically outlast time. And they wanted these things to become sort of heirlooms that get um, trans transferred from family member to family member and passed down because they're such beautiful quality and they really add character to a home and that's when the first concept really hit me and I went well if we're talking about your items adding character to a home then we need this whole brand to be about that process is the fact that the items that you're selling are full of character they're all unique from one item to the next there's no mass production here they're all handmade so there's that real individuality to them so that led me to go back to the drawing board and I created this final visual direction which I then sent to them and they loved this one it was much closer they wanted to be inspired or wanted to inspire the audience by sort of natural landscapes, things that felt more rugged, that reminded people of being outside and feeling things. So they really wanted the brand to have a lot of emotion to it. So a lot of texture and a lot of very natural feel and they wanted something that was really imperfect, something that had lots of character and lots of texture. So I ended up going back to the original thought process of mine, which was, okay, we need an emblem or something that's going to be super organic and a bit more abstract so that it sort of hints towards nature and craft and creativity without being sort of too on the nose. So we really worked this and they absolutely loved it. And they had a couple of final tweaks pretty much to do just with color. So I didn't actually put it into the stylescape because by then we were sort of on a bit of a tight deadline. So we sort of moved on to the next phase. And the next phase for me was sketching. Now, I always do this to start off my process. I pull in my keywords and I jump onto my iPad in Procreate and I start sketching. 
Whether the sketches are good or not doesn't really matter to me. It's all about getting my ideas onto paper and really working out what direction I want to take the brand before I jump into a digital program and start working with fonts. Sometimes I find I'm then too quick to try and make things perfect. So the sketching process is really where the creative magic happens. So after I'd done a bunch of sketching, I jumped into Illustrator and pulled my sketches in so that I could use them as a base. So you'll see here, I've pulled them in and done a little image trace on them so that I can start pulling them out and was really happy with where things were going. Now, as you saw previously, I did a bunch of different sketches, but I pretty much came to the idea that I wanted to use quite quickly. And it was definitely sitting here somewhere Somewhere. So the next thing I do when I'm creating logos is I'll pull in the stylescape obviously to have that as a visual anchor and then I'll just start playing with fonts and this is a good process. Sometimes if I'm doing a handcrafted logo, for example, if I'm going to actually do the font from scratch, I will still pull in fonts that it already exist to use as a base because I'm definitely not a type designer expert. Um, I know the basics, but I definitely am not as skilled as some of the awesome font designers out there. So I need personally a bit of a base. So I'll always come and pop in some fonts that I think will work. And sometimes I try things like this, for example, which are totally out there. And I do that so that I can create contrast for myself so that I can test whether or not the ideas I have in my head are actually going to work. And I quickly realized through this process that an uppercase logo was just going to be a little too much and it was going to be just way too strong. So you can see through this process that I pretty much just go and start exploring. I tried this idea of wanting to turn the E into something that resembled plants and growing and weaving. But for me, it was just a little bit too literal and I just didn't enjoy the shape it was looking a little too much like a palm tree I tried all sorts of different ideas and you can see here that I start bringing in ideas for um, for taglines and sentences that suit the brand because for me I'm the kind of designer who gets just as inspired by words as I do by images so for me my creative process includes a lot of writing and a lot of exploring that way you can see I start, my lovely artboards are a chaotic blend of everything inside my brain. I'm sure anybody who's tried to design like this knows exactly what I'm talking about. Um, so I bring in the keywords again and I'm just really trying to explore different ideas. I had this thing in my head where I really wanted to create a monogram that was going to contrast against the more organic icon I was thinking of designing. So I wanted to create something like this and I was playing with that and then really exploring other ideas. And then this is another thing I do here is I bring in imagery to test out how a logo will look um, in context because, you know, in the real world, it's very rare that you just see a logo on a white background. It's usually in the context of something. So I try and bring those in just to give myself a bit of context. You can see I actually started trying to design my own font um, uh, and just really playing with that, but ended up scrapping that idea. I didn't really like it. This is where the magic really started because I knew that we needed something with a bit more weight to it. Um, so keep that in mind. We can come back to that later started playing with color palettes and then this is where I sort of started coming up with the original concept. I really wanted some typography that was going to be super unique so pulling in all of these like sort of thicks and thins and for me this was just a way for the brand to be super unique and I loved the shape and the flow of all of that so I really played with this idea quite a lot and started leveraging my illustrations and this is where I actually pulled this initial illustration out and started going okay I think we have a logo now this is the thing about the creative process right so the, for me design is all about happy accidents. And I know that sounds really strange because shouldn't the logo design process be really structured? 
Well, sometimes it can be, but for me, it's a very instinctive thing. And even though I'll know more or less which direction I want to go in, and often I will have reasons for doing stuff, obviously, but it is it is very much about the feel of it. So this is what I played with. And the next thing that I did was take everything into a presentation. And this is where I start building things out and really playing with a concept because this is where I start testing my own theories and, and working out whether it works. So I'll break the logo down for the client and just give them some pointers because I will actually present the identity to them over a call. Um, but I always like to give some annotations so that they can refer back later on. Um, so my brand presentations always include a load of markups because this allows the client to visualize what's actually happening and what their identity is going to look like in the real world. So I start pulling in some mockups and explaining my thinking. I knew that because they were a product-based business, we needed some tags. I knew that they were going to want to send thank you cards and they needed business cards. So we pulled in some of those. And then the key thing I really like to do is actually show them what the identity suite looks like. So this is me just ideating a little bit um, in terms of layouts and tagline lockups and what to do with the icon and emblem and how we can break the, the font up and the type. And then bringing in some sort of collateral. I drew these patterns on uh, Procreate and I thought these would be a really great way to extend the brand some embossing, a photo of the actual product just to showcase how it all works together, some textured backgrounds. And then I like to give them a bit of an idea of photographic direction as well, which can help because these guys hadn't planned their product shoot yet. So they wanted me to help them with the art direction of that. So just thinking about those ideas when designing this presentation, talking them through typography. And then you can see that this presentation is sort of very messy because I sort of haphazardly create different slides, not in order. Um, and then I usually take this into InDesign and actually design the presentation properly. Um, but this is where I get all my ideas out and test it. So that presentation went off to them and they pretty much loved it. They came back with a couple of sort of feedbacks and then we spoke a bit more and realized that um, the logo itself actually looked a little too 70s. And once we saw that, we couldn't unsee it and all of us could only think about Austin Powers and Groovy Baby. So um, uh, we had to change the direction because we felt it was just a little too far into the creative space, was just a little too weird and wonderful. And they actually really wanted to dial it back a little bit. They loved the icon and wanted to keep that, but wanted to simplify the identity. So we ended up going back to the drawing board and doing a little bit of revisions. Now, keeping in mind, they loved everything about the identity except the word mark. They really wanted that to be reworked. So this is when I went back to my Illustrator board and had a look at some of the explorations that I had done previously. And when I came back to presenting a revised look to them, I, of course, started the presentation with the existing logo mark just so that we could reorientate around where we were and then showed them the two new explorations. So on the left is the one that I really wanted to go with. This is the one that I felt was the strongest. It was a good blend between sort of something that felt quite crafted and unique and something that was a bit more structured. And then on the right was just an alternative. And sometimes I'll do this in this phase. It's not very common, but I wanted to create a bit of contrast because we had mentioned that they wanted to see something in all uppercase. And so I wanted to show them what it might look like. So with that being said, we did that. And we then moved on to showing them what it would look like in sort of context with everything else, making the color palette official, and then just building out that again for them to see. So this process is super simple. The second presentation is usually a lot more sort of um, 
tight and simple with slightly less executions because by now they already can see that the concept is going to work and it's just about finalizing the logo. So once we had done that and they were happy with how the logo stood out against its competitors and we'd moved on from there, we went into the next phase, which was me designing out all the brand collateral. And that was a cool process. It was one of those ones that was quite rushed because they had the opportunity to launch their products through a pop-up shop here in South Africa at the Kruger National Park. And so it was really exciting opportunity. So we quickly rushed through getting some basic uh, brand collateral ready, like tags and product cards and some cotton labels. And pretty much while that was being worked on and once that had gone to print and that was all sorted, it was time for me to create the brand guidelines. So let's jump into those and I'll give you a quick snapshot of what I ended up with. So before we jump into the brand guidelines, let's quickly jump into how I set up the files for the client. So I will create a folder on Google Drive, which is my sort of file sharing preference and I will create a couple of different folders. The first one is a start here folder which has basically got a little thank you note in it and some instructions for where to find their files um, other than the fact that they're actually in the folder but sometimes you know I really like to just help a client out and give them some sort of extra steps. Then I'll have a file specifically for logos and items and I will name these all and in there they will get all the different formats that they need. I will also provide them a bit of a snapshot of all the different logo files labeled so that they know which one is which. Then I'll have a file for all the collateral print files for example, everything that we did there. I'll have the brand guidelines and then anything extra. So say for example, we did illustration sets or template files or something like that that'll go in here. Um, so in the brand guidelines, I really like to provide for my clients two versions, a large one, which can be shared sort of locally and it's got a super high res version and then a small one, which can be sent via email, which is super useful for if they're trying to get somebody else to help them with their brand. So jumping into the style guide, I want to kick things off with a note that I do tend to use a template for my style guides. However, I will always make sure that I go in and actually customize it to suit the brand. Now, I use a template in terms of my structure and over the years, I've sort of worked out what to include and what not to include. And because all the brands I work with tend to be quite different, I'll often adapt the template based on what they need at any given moment in their style guides. For me, I really want style guides to be useful for the branders, uh, the brand owners. I really want them to be something that they actually pay attention to. Um, there are some really cool options out there for sort of digitizing style guides and making them interactive. And I'm actually exploring that with another client at the moment, which is also really exciting if you want to do something that is far more useful for your client in terms of longevity and customization. You don't have to sort of keep coming back to a PDF to update it. But for brands like this who are in their early startup stages, they don't have the budget necessarily for a massive digital style guide. And you know, I still find that a good PDF can actually be quite useful for this client. You know, it's it's always available whether you've got internet connection or not. Um, and there are still benefits to doing it like this. So here we've got the PDF style guide. And basically what I like to do is do a little welcome for anybody who might be using the style guide. We've got a contents page. And we pretty much go through everything, including some of the brand strategy by putting in the brand's personality, some of its positioning statements and vision and all of that good stuff. Also sort of making mention of the taglines, words we like and don't like. And then of course, the crux of any style guide is how to use the logos. And so I've done this for each of the logos for the brand, including all of the sub brand elements and monograms. And then we've also mentioned, you know, how to use the logo on backgrounds and things like that. And then this is where we get into talking about the collateral again. So 
With this in mind, I'm sort of mentioning in this context where the logo goes in, in terms of collateral and which logo to use when. Um, because this is a fairly new brand, these guidelines aren't hugely robust in terms of placement. And because what's sort of happening is they are experimenting with what's working and what's not working. And so in about six months time to a year, we will do a revision of the style guide and we'll actually go and update things according to what's worked for them and what hasn't. I think it's key to remember that brands these days are so dynamic and they should be dynamic. They should be living, breathing things that can be updated. We don't want Want things like style guides to be a rigid box that keeps them sort of constrained. We want them to be able to play with their brands and use these design elements that you've given them to, I don't know, inspire creativity and keep them ambitious and keep them excited about their brand. So I like to give them ideas and guidelines, but I try not to restrict them in terms of going, well, you know, I've designed this logo and it must be used exactly like this. Barring them stretching and pulling and changing the colors, I'm, I'm pretty okay with them exploring their brands. They, it must feel like something that they are in love with and something they enjoy using. So with that in mind, I sort of give them some ideas, but it's pretty much up to them and I'll sort of help them out if they need any help. Okay, so then we of course talk about brand color, typography and you know type layout and setting and what to do about that and then this like I mentioned earlier is where I gave them some guidelines on product photography. Now this is key because in these beginning stages they didn't have any product photography yet and I had said to them if you're going to invest your money anywhere when you're a product-based business invest it in good product photography because it will go the whole way for you and um, It'll be really great content for social media. It's going to make your website look 10 times better. You can have a beautifully designed website, but if you've got crappy imagery, then you've got crappy imagery. So I thought, you know what, rather invest in good photography and, you know, when the budget allows, we'll match that photography with a super custom website, but it's not really needed right now. So with that being said, I'll jump into what we did for their website. Now, we realized in South Africa, e-commerce is quite challenging. We're very limited with payment options and shipping options. So we have to sort of we have to guard what we do quite carefully. So with this brand, we went with Shopify, which was the best option. And because we'd gone with investing in a proper brand identity and strategy, and we'd really dive deep into that, the recommendation was actually that they keep their website really simple and that we potentially choose a really nice robust theme on Shopify and customize that to suit them while they spend the next six months to a year growing their business and working out what works and what doesn't. For me as a brand designer and as a professional service provider, I don't like pro you know, recommending to clients something they might not need. I'm never going to oversell something that they can get away with a simple cost-effective version. There are ways that you can make a cost-effective cost effective version work. And this is a prime example. Is this website hugely customized and like super creative? No. Does it work and do the job? Yes. And with the beautiful images that we've got, we've actually ended up with a website that looks really, really great. So this was done by a colleague of mine who, um, you know, is very comfortable with Shopify, but she's not, she doesn't classify herself as a full Shopify designer or developer. So we worked together on customizing this theme and she did a really good job of implementing the style guide and, and taking that advice. And we created for them this really simple, beautiful website and Shopify is absolutely fantastic in terms of its functionality and its options that it gives you so I mean we we really had you know we had a blast putting this together it's incredibly simple and easy to use and super easy for the client to update and manage and it's been working just fine and I think in a couple of months time we'll probably look at doing an update or, or doing some more customization but so far so good and this was a super inspiring project I really enjoyed working on it it was something that was a bit out of my comfort zone because I'd never really done super product focused businesses I'm usually more in the digital 
digital space. So this was a really nice um, growth opportunity for me as well to explore that and to consider, you know, how logos need to be applied um, in print and in digital and, you know, does it scale well, all of those things. So this was a great project for that and the client was absolutely fantastic and it was a pleasure to work with them. So that's about it, guys. I hope this was inspiring. I hope that it sparked some thoughts. I hope it was insightful. And if you'd like to see more content like this, then absolutely hit that subscribe button and stick around. We're going to be releasing way more branding content on this channel in the coming months. So if you're interested in that, then please stick around and I will see you soon. Cheers. Cheers.